Hello everyone, my name is Caroline O'Regan. I work with the Institute of Leadership in the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to talk about how we can communicate effectively during this really challenging and difficult time for us all. What is clear is that the challenges that we face are going to go on, not just for the weeks, but for some months ahead. So this is a long term process and it's absolutely vital that we care for ourselves. In supporting you, the RCSI are planning to run a series of webinars to support our healthcare workers in the Irish healthcare system. I'm delighted and I want to welcome Dr. Miriam Colleran. Miriam is a consultant in palliative care in St. Bridget's Hospice and also in Nace General Hospital. She's here with us this evening to talk about PPE, the impact on healthcare communications and the loss of the many communication processes that underpin how we have communicated care until this pandemic began. Miriam, it's lovely to see you. This the issue of caring behind a mask with compassionate communication in the COVID-19 crisis. Specifically, the need now than ever to cover up and protect our healthcare people to keep them safe is vital. There have been amazing concerns around the lack of PPE and supplies over the past few weeks, and we have seen huge deliveries from China into our country. So we feel it's timely to talk about PPE as we know it protects our frontline staff. But we are also hearing about how this is changing the way we work, especially in how we communicate with our vulnerable patients, our frightened families, and indeed each other as teams. Miriam, it's lovely to see you this evening. Maybe you can tell us what's going on at the moment. Good evening, Caroline. Well, I think the first thing to say is that we are now practicing medicine during a pandemic. So we are, we are suddenly practicing a very different type of medicine to what we practiced before. We have not practiced in a pandemic before. I joined Twitter a few months ago, and yesterday I was reading a tweet from a medical SHO in London, Dr. George Holston. He anonymously described having certified far more patients' deaths in a single shift on Wednesday night than he could remember previously having done. But it was the personalised things that were really affecting him. The patient's watch still ticking, an unread text message from the family. And he said that pandemic medicine is hard. And I think that he really encapsulated it. Pandemic medicine is hard. As a healthcare service at all levels, everyone has been really, really pulling out the stops and trying to prepare, to prepare very, very quickly for COVID care and COVID management. We are watching and reading in particular the Chinese and the Italian experience, but we're also checking the international research. But this is new to us. This is a sudden change in medicine just like it's a sudden change for the rest of society. And there are staffing and resource implications so that we can meet the immediate crisis facing us. We're working differently in many ways, Caroline, because of COVID. Staff are getting infected, some are self-isolating, and others are remote working. I am actually remote working myself because we are cocooning my daughter who is medically vulnerable. So this is all a very, very different type of healthcare, very quickly for us as healthcare workers. Even since we started talking about this, you and I, about the impact of PPE on communication, issues have changed and new issues are developing. We need, as a healthcare service, to be responsive to our patient care and healthcare staff. It's important to talk about pandemic medicine. It's new for us all. Thank you, Jim. and I totally agree. We in the college are working remotely too, and that is quite a different way of working. So we're having to learn new skills terribly quickly. 
and um, to support our colleagues who we work with in the Irish healthcare system. So I have a few questions that I'd like to put to you, Miriam. Can you tell us knowing it? Can you tell us about what's actually happening right now in the system? Okay. okay. So I suppose the first thing to say is that PPE is essential, that it's essential for staff safety, must be protected. PPE is another layer over your body. So the wearer can get very warm. That's a practical issue. A medical colleague described, that PP, described to me that PPE is uncomfortable for the wearer and that it's really not possible to wear PPE for prolonged periods of time. A staff member wearing PPE isn't actually really meant to sit down in the patient's room because, well, you see, the problem is that there's a, real, there's a risk of contamination from a contaminated service from a contaminated surface like a chair or a table or so so one service actually removed the chairs for staff from those patients bedrooms that was done to protect staff but it does mean that the doctor or a nurse who is fully who's gowned up in their ppe and assessing a patient in that room has to stand while chatting and assessing the patient while potentially feeling very uncomfortably warm dressed in ppe in the room um, and that, of course, applies to not just patients who have COVID, but also to many patients who are suspected to have COVID, but may turn out subsequently not to have, you know. So, so I suppose other practicalities that we're seeing, Caroline, is that for, for staff protection, staff have to, clinical staff have to spend less time in the room with a patient who has COVID or has suspected COVID. And that's to decrease the risk but it also means that there's a decreased in-person, direct face-to-face, person-to-person communication time. And that's on top of the already, already the risk um, from having the physical discomfort from the PPE. So, yeah. so when the staff member, the doctor or nurse is, is wearing PPE, it's harder, it's more difficult to make eye contact with the patient wearing goggles and wearing masks. And, and as you can appreciate, um, uh, uh, there's a loss of the nuances of mouth expressions, of smiles, of all those things that we all look out for instinctively without realising when we're chatting with another person. Yeah. A nursing friend was described to me how she actually found it easier to make eye contact with the patient wearing, the, wearing a visor than goggles. But in reality, wow. that's a resource issue. You know, yeah. that's a resource yeah. issue. It, de yeah, it depends course. on what is available. Absolutely. It depends on what is available. And we all have global PPE with COVID. Clinical staff must wear PPE appropriately to protect themselves. Um, uh, and that's essential to help decrease the risk of spread of COVID, but it does impact in our communication with patients. Um, I was chatting with another nursing colleague about um, about when, like, to, if two healthcare workers, like, say, if two nurses are delivering care simultaneously to a patient, and they were both obviously gowned up in their PPE. And he said that he didn't find any particular difficulty in that context wearing PPE, but that their focus as a team was very much on timely care and working in sync with one another regarding the task at hand. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's a risk of contamination from PPE, including when taking it off. So there was yeah. training for staff. Yeah, there was training for staff on donning and removing PPE. Um, there was a video demonstration available available for viewing from Professor Cormick and for staff about how to do so. And some hospitals, like my own, did additional training, did additional training to it. You know, um, this, this is very different to how we were practicing mm. medicine just a month ago, and we had a much more open style of communication and much more of the and very clear use of body language with our patients and, and their families as well. Yeah. Another site when preparing for COVID management actually installed phones into the patients' bedrooms. And I thought that was just a, such a brilliant idea and a really practical one. And, and the whole idea was to aid and to improve communication with patients. Another option would be video consultation. A video consultation is an option in hospital, as is happening in the community. But that doesn't work if a patient is confused or if the patient is acutely unwell and just needs a medical assessment. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 That same hospital you, actually has. Go, yeah. Sorry, Caroline. Yeah. You talked to me earlier on about um, the therapeutic contact with the patient and the issues yes. around communication of symptom assessment, and of course sure. the loneliness. 
parents and yes. the difficulty of the families seeing and supporting their ill and their dying ones. Sure. And you spoke about examples that you have picked up in the health services to address that. Yes, 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 yes. Well, I mean, even just one lo one lovely example in that one particular hospital is is patients in isolation rooms the option of having new stickers. And I think that's just that invaluable intangible recognizing one another as people that human touch there's a lot to be proud of in the way the healthcare service has adapted so quickly to a huge and is still trying to give compassionate individualized patient focused but while recognizing the challenges we're facing from covid this this is what we strive for we have to keep adapting our practice to this immense challenge in a practical way yeah. And exactly as you were saying there, Caroline, as we were chatting earlier, there's there, there are the other issues that we're, we're we're facing are the challenge of symptom assessment when there's less direct patient contact, less direct time assessing the patient. There's there's the potential for loneliness of patients. We're, we're very much well we're culturally we're very much about being with other people and have and, and social um, and and that's a huge part of our culture but now our patients are actually going to have to be in isolation or and away from other people that's difficult for them it can be very difficult for their families trying to get to see them trying to get to support their ill or dying loved ones if the patient is in a hospital or in a hospice or a nursing home yes sometimes yeah, yeah. Yeah. Some patients will be intubated, they'll be sedated, and they may be prone as part of their care. Um, yeah. It's a very different, and, and for those patients who sadly won't survive, and who sadly will die, or have their, have their die sooner than we would have expected because of COVID, um, it's, it's a different style of end-of-life care, particularly in hospital in institutions like hospitals, hospices, and nursing homes at the moment because of COVID. All yes. this, all this has to happen, but it's another change and a potential loss for the staff as well as the patients, because our healthcare staff now will get to deliver the same holistic end of life care that we had all been able to provide as recently as a month ago. Yes, I think we both read that article that discussed the lack of accessing of routine healthcare. Is a is a leading cause of mortality after disasters. So yes. that's really a, a really another really important healthcare issue for us. And we've certainly seen very eminent consultants and ED consultants coming out and and stroke consultants the importance of patients attending for acute medical problems and to avoid delay. That they do need to attend their GP. They do need to attend their hospitals. Mm -hmm. So this is this is all happening. All this complexity is happening, and it's in the context of a climate of fear. Yes, fear, fear as a society, fear as as people, a fear of COVID, a fear of getting it, fear of passing it on, a fear of our loved ones getting it and becoming seriously ill, and a fear of death. Yes, pandemic medicine is hard. Yes, yeah, yeah. And and in this new norm, um, Miriam, and thank you for that. Um, and we spoke about this earlier. Um, the way you, in which you work and healthcare clinicians are working is terribly different to what we have done a month ago. And in the communication of how we care for our people, um, it's now behind masks. And so my question, I suppose, to you is. You know, in practice, how is this different to what we were doing before, apart from the obvious that we've discussed? Um, but given that we know that communications are hugely important in medical care, yeah. um, and it's a part of a key part of your role, um, mm -hmm. what are you seeing in your practice? Okay, well, exactly as you're saying, Caroline, communication skills are hugely important in medical care. Good communication skills are a key part of patient care, of assessment of the patient's symptoms, concerns and worries, and for communicating and agreeing a, pl a plan of care with the patient and communicating, if appropriate, with the patient's loved ones. PPE does affect communication, as we discussed. The other person can see your facial expressions and those 
precious small gestures of support, the encouragement to the encouragement to have support and motivate them to keep going. For the patients themselves, it's particularly hard, as they may be sick, anxious, and can understandably be frightened in some cases. So we have to be particularly mindful to focus on our verbal communication, the tone of our voice, the importance of being aware and sensitive to the inflections in our messaging. Before COVID-19, patients could literally have more visitors in to see them in hospitals, hospices yes. and nursing homes. Now, this does vary slightly in different institutions, but, but visiting is much more restricted now than what it used to be a month ago. Yeah. It has to be to stop the spread. This mm -hmm. is particularly hard, though, at the end of life. We both agree Irish culture tr does dying very well. It's yes. very supportive both of the dying person and of the family. There is an envelopment of the, by the extended family, friends and community during the dying phase and into the bereavement often for the loved ones. But this has suddenly changed for us with COVID. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. My own, my own father actually died a few years ago of a malignant brain tumour in ICU. He, he died started. a day... We were very lucky. He was a great man. He died a day after, after he was extubated. Our mom had already died a few years before that. The ICU team were absolutely amazing looking after him. And what's really unusual when someone is dying, it's really unusual when someone's dying to be awake as he or she is imminently dying. But he was actually awake when he was dying, but he couldn't speak. He, he was actually going in and out of heart arrhythmias. But in his dying moments, we were there with him in ICU and he could see all his children around him, their spouses, some grandchildren and his brother. He died knowing that we were all there with him. But also, it's been a great support to us to know that when he needed us, we were there. Now, that's really unusual that he was awake. It, I mean, in an advanced illness setting, most people are actually unconscious when they're dying. But this is very, what we experienced and we were, what we were privileged to experience with our dad. So many people in our country are losing that now. There has yeah. to be visiting restrictions in hospitals, in hospices and in nursing homes with COVID-19. But it means that family won't have the same time to spend with their dying loved ones like before. Yes. This is an enormous change for us as a society and for us as healthcare workers. How do we adjust and deliver compassionate care to so many patients in isolation and also with so many staff either getting sick or self-isolating? Absolutely. It's, it's, um, it's changing in front of our eyes really, isn't it? And when yes, we talk yeah. about, you know, the impact of how we communicate with each other, um, with PPE, even thinking beyond that to all of the issues you've brought up around and loved ones dying and we haven't peaked yet according to the news so this is going to become even more important as we move on into the weeks ahead of us um, so you know it's it's a terribly sensitive subject but it's terribly important and it's one we need to talk about um, so what would you say as a clinician um, working in, in this area knowing what's happening that the actual impact on how we are communicating across those settings um, is having of course about the dying and their families and how that has to be different for safety and also other reasons. Um, but even in relation to the day-to-day -day caring of our patients, what can you see that's different in terms of, of the impact? So you spoke about we know that the communication of nonverbals is is hugely minimised because people are faceless now nearly in that you were we were talking earlier on and um, that they were, were working now with masks and goggles in some cir circumstances and that yes. in the doing of that, the very small gestures and expressions on our face um, are lost you know the subtle yes. cues of empathetic yes. smiles um, are being lost and that's terribly difficult for clinicians and um, to give yes. uh, that level of comfort so the way that language is sort of being taken away from us and we have to adapt terribly quickly sure. um, in 
very big challenges that healthcare professionals face while seeking to accomplish their work in this hugely demanding and changing environment. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as a human, as a clinician, it's a very difficult world that we're trying to change and adapt to. So, sure. in terms of these subtle cues, what would you be giving advice to clinicians in how to address that um, to support them in their roles working with terribly vulnerable, frightened, sick people and covered in people? Sure, sure. Well, well, I suppose some of it is very practical, Miriam and um, Caroline, in terms of having to regularly check during the assessment that our patients are reassured and that they have heard us. Um, and, and it could even be that after leaving a patient's room, there can be another question that needs to be asked of the patient. Um, now, if the patient is well enough, what we, what we as doctors and nurses and healthcare workers can do is actually just rip back into the patient if the patient has gone in the room or their own smartphone, they have their own mobile phone. Um, so a patient can get phoned if it's clinically appropriate rather than increase the risk to the healthcare worker by returning to the room. And the patient would still actually be able to get that voice contact. Okay. And, and I think we also, yeah, and I think we also need to recognise that there will be a difference between hospital based care and care at home or in the community. GPs are the frontline medical practitioners in the community. However, with the COVID pandemic, we must all adhere to HSC guidance on, serv on service provision in terms of um, in infection control and, and preventing the spread. So, so that we care for, pa for patients as well as possible, but also help stop the spread. So we're working very differently at medical GPs. There is much more use of phone advice and, and less direct, unrestricted face-to-face -face assessment. Yes. Um, from a hospital perspective, what we're doing differently is like over the last decade, the Hospital Friendly Hospitals program has been a collaboration between the HSC and the Irish Hospitals Foundation. And it's many hospitals. It focused on enhancing end of life care and was really focused on good communication. But like I mentioned earlier, uh, there's with, with the necessary visiting restrictions in hospitals and hospices, this is also affecting our communication with families. Yes. Uh, yes. Patients may have loved ones that are actually either elderly themselves or medically vulnerable and not actually be able to visit them in a hospital or in hospices because they're cocooning themselves for their own well-being. Yes, of course. And I think that brings us back to the point we talked about earlier on when you mentioned the importance of taking um, care and reviewing the loneliness of patients that they're experiencing right now and the difficulties for families and sure. um, trying to support their loved ones. And I suppose, you know, what we know right now, given that we're all in this very unprecedented um, vortex, if you had a crystal ball, what would you do differently as a clinician? I right, suppose so you're right. And, and what we're going through is pre unprecedented and it has evolved and it is un continuing to evolve. And we are learning so much from Italy and Spain and China. And, and I think as part of our ongoing active COVID management planning and compassionate care planning is also as healthcare workers becoming much more comfortable and skilled in communicating effectively while being while being gowned in PPE and list, yeah. and very importantly listening to our colleagues concerns. Uh, yeah. You and I Caroline we're, we're both on Twitter and, and, and yeah. as we know medical Twitter has been very active about sharing comprehensive information about COVID practices and yeah. clinical management. And, and, and as you mentioned, the challenges that we are face are, are going to go on not just weeks, but no. yeah. months. So this is a long term process. Yeah. And it's yeah. absolutely vital that we keep focusing on how we are caring behind the masks. How are we communicating? Yes. How are we doing? And how can we improve? Yeah, absolutely. And as you said, and I completely concur, I mean, it is evolving daily and we're learning. Yeah. Um, I suppose that brings me into, you know, how we adapt. I mean, we're very good at human beings to adapting. Um, sure. So how are we adapting our communication while covered up, which is protecting our staff? And what are we learning as the situation evolves, even though it's evolving very quickly? Yeah. Um, well, I suppose and it's coming back to what we were saying, um, that as clinicians, as doctors, as nurses, as healthcare workers, we go to work to help our patients. That, that's the whole. That's the whole purpose of what we do. Caring for the patient, dear, is health, health, health care, and having to rely maybe on distinguishing voices, 
how tall the person is under is coming, or something else like that to identify them. So, so I can't stress enough that we need to overcompensate on the communication protocol and continually check, reassure the patient and families that we understand what they're saying and to explain what we're doing. Okay. We, we need to practice compassion. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now more than ever, we need to practice compassion for ourselves, the patients we care for, and their families. If you and I, Caroline, were having this chat two months ago and you asked me about breaking bad news, I'd have said breaking bad news had to be done in person and we'd have had a chat about all the techniques and practices that we used to use. But now we're practicing pandemic medicine. And part of that has to include getting more skilled at phone consultations, video consultations, and breaking bad news over the phone if needed. Australia is very progressive in video consultations, in particular because of the recent bushfires. So we need to learn to adapt to the loss or limited body language and really focus on our verbal communication skills. There are, there are, however, though, a lot of kind and sensitive resources out there and available for us to do this and to help guide us in these skills. It can be learned. These are exceptional times, but we're adapting. We're adapting. And like in, in, in fact, like say for a patient who's in a shared room, like perhaps a six-bedded ward, um, a six-bedded ward with other patients who, who who may have COVID, there may be healthcare workers assigned in that room, uh, caring for the, for the day, etc. For, for a bit of time, and that, but that healthcare worker would obviously be adhering to social distancing, except when giving direct care. It, another, yes. like another, another situation that I'm familiar with um, from a colleague is that if a patient is in a single room and the staff member is in there and needs assessment, needs assistance of the, of the staff member who's inside the patient's room, communicating with colleagues outside by putting a sign in the window of the room. So, and um, people are adapting very quickly in practice, you know. Some services are making planned phone calls to a, to a designated family member of, of an inpatient just to help them on how their loved one in, which is really reassuring for the family member knowing that they're going to get a phone call. Smartphones can help yes. with communication, but not everybody uses a smartphone or is able to use a smartphone, or they may actually feel well to use So we spoke about this um, earlier on yes. about you know giving all of that and. In your profession, if you were entering or you needed to bring someone, a new person onto your team, and given that what you've said, it's such a privilege to be involved yes. in the work about caring for others. What would be yes. the most important thing for them? Well, 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 I think it's coming back to that we know that clinicians' compassion helps reduce the anxiety and stress of patients. But it's vital that we talk to our members about how we need to work together. Listen help one yes. another and create a climate of compassion. Click our population to have patients. The normal protocol routines that we now use are very different to just a month ago. Everyone, everything is changing very rapidly, day by day. We need to talk about that and be flexible in our working. Flexibility is essential. The normal working hours and conditions may not be the same anymore and, 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 and staff may be asked to do longer shifts at the moment. Um, which is difficult, you know. We know, but we know from time what doctors needed was rest and PPE. Staff must have time off and time away from thinking about COVID. So that daily reviewing and planning is is vital, and that they ensure that they get the appropriate amount of rest to eat and to maintain their own health and well-being. But but this, as we both know, Caroline, is an evolving situation. We have to be adaptive and to respond to this new situation, and it does need adaptive thinking and may need working outside the box. Yes, yeah. Yep, well, thank you for that. I think, I think that feeds into some of the materials that we have been given by Professor Michael West when he talks specifically in this time how that rest and good sleep is very good practice and that, you know, while we may feel like we have to limit the amount of time we sleep, given that this challenge is going on for months, it's vital that we develop good sleeping patterns and take care of ourselves. And we've talked about this at, at length. Yes. Um, and we have some supports that we can, can put up. Miriam, thank you so much. Um, it's been a pleasure. And we have spoken a lot for the last couple of days. Um, we're coming to the end now. So I'm just going to pass over to my colleague, Tina, who I know has been collating some messages uh, and questions coming in from our okay. audience. Tina. 
Thank you very much, Caroline, and thank you very much, Miriam. Thanks, Tina. So I've just been keeping an eye on the questions that have been coming in and the feedback and the comments. And just very quickly, I'll go through some because I think these may be the focus of further um, webinars that we can look at. But there's one in from Jonathan looking at the long term psychological impacts of PPE over a period of time of what this might mean for. Um, Siobhan has a suggestion around an initiative that we came across recently on ICU the missing days, uh, the diary for that, that a diary that uh, patients can keep or families can keep. Tyrone has come in with a question around how do we substitute the touch on the shoulder, the smile of support that we would have given a loved one in, in, in the past. Eileen has asked about the number of patients who are not going to survive ICU and sure. maybe is there an opportunity there for having those conversations before intubation and whether that's going to be possible and what strategies we could look at for that. So I think, again, that's a really important one we might come back to. And Deborah is asking about advice for those working with sick children and people with intellectual challenges. Again, that, that because of the, the, the difficulties that that brings. And then writing down, Katrina has come in there just now saying about, do you think that writing the names on PPE could help with communication with patients? And I suppose that kind of goes back to the, the badges that most people have, which is, hello, my name is. Um, and maybe a different way yeah. of dealing with that. Yeah. So I think there's a lot there that we probably won't have time to deal with this evening, but we certainly capture all of that information and those feedback. And because we're going to have a series of these mm -hmm. webinars, so I think some of that are, are topics that we're going to be able to come back to. So back over to yourself. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, and Miriam, thank you again so much. And I'd just like to say that some of the key takeaways from today is that PP is vital. We need to protect our people. The way we have com mm -hmm. we're communicating has changed. And we need yes. to learn new ways of doing that compassionately. And to consider a further yes. conversation that matters on fear and loneliness of the patients and the difficulties for families. And our next conversation that matters is next Tuesday at 6.30 with yourself and a panel of Dr. John Fitzsimons, who's consultant paediatrician in Our Lady of Lourdes Hospital, but he's also a clinical director with the Director of Quality Improvement Division in the HSE, and also Miss Karen Green, who is the Director of Nursing in the RCSI Hospital Group, Beaumont Hospital. So we're looking forward to that. And also any suggestions that the public may have around conversations that matter to Miriam Holden in the RCSI.ie. And I want to really thank you. This is our first conversation that matters. Thank you so much for all of the work that you have put in in the background collating all of the data. I know you have a few suggestions for conversations that matter. Um, and we're part of a small user group, so we can bring those to the fore. The topic of next Tuesday's is decision making ethics. in pandemics, isn't it, Caroline? And that's what yeah, we're going it's, to look at. We're actually going to focus on ethics yes. in the pandemic from a yes. clinical point of view and from a nursing and the impact in nursing and clinical care. Miriam, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And to all the Miriams and Shun yes. and Dara and Tina and the audience. <laughs>